Thunder, 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 Thunder Geeks are live! Hello, Thundarians! You're listening to 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at luradio.ca. That was Geek Power by Olivia Anna Livke. And of course, I'm Andrew. I'm Rob. And I'm Megan. And bursting awkwardly from the bathroom, we are your Thunder Geeks. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. As every week, we are the Thunder Geeks. We sit down every week, like to talk about friendship, like to talk about geek stuff, and like to talk about all the craziness happening behind the scenes of everything we love. So, a lot of fun stuff that's been happening, but as always, let's talk about what we've been doing this week. How about you, Rob? What, what's what been your goal this week? My goal this week has been to watch all 30 years of classic Doctor Who. You want to watch 30 years worth of television. Yeah, man, it's awesome. It's like one of the best shows out there. Now, I I, I know there's uh, Doctor Who's been running for a very, very, very long time. So tell us a little bit more about, like, for someone who's never watched Doctor Who before, give them the basics. The basics is there's a time-traveling alien called the Doctor. Not Doctor Who, the Doctor. And he goes around in space and time in his TARDIS, T-A-R-D-I-S, time and alternate dimension in space. <laughs> And he just has a human sidekick, and they just go around the universe doing what they want. And when shenanigans ensues, it's up to the Doctor to save the day. So, uh, for me, I've caught a bit of Doctor Who. I have not watched too, too much of it. Uh, the main things that I've seen are episodes from the Matt Smith era. Now, how many Doctors have they gone on through? Because I find it interesting the mechanic they have to replace their main actor. Because I think it's a genius idea, because it lets the show be renewed and lets it be different every time. Well, uh, we're on 12 right now, Peter Capaldi. And, yeah, the actual the fun fact is Regeneration was actually called Renewal because uh, Sidney Crosby, fun fact, Canadian. The guy who created Doctor Who is Canadian. Sidney uh, Crosby? Yeah. Wait, you're what? telling me that Sidney Crosby... It may not be the one you're thinking of. Yeah, we're thinking oh, of the okay. hockey player. So that's, oh, okay. No. That's a very, very, very different uh, different show there. So no. and so it was written by Sidney Crosby. Was this before or after he won the uh, the Olympic <laughs> gold medal? The, way, way, way before. Way before. So way back in the 60s. Way back in the 60s. So Sidney Cry- uh, Crosby, the time-traveling hockey player, wrote a story <laughs> about a uh, time-traveling doctor. Go. And... Fun fact, uh, the original, uh, after the airing of the first episode, the show was slated to cancel because it had horrible ratings, but that was mostly due to the fact that the day it aired, the day Doctor Who aired, is the Kennedy assassination, sadly. So people watch that and not Doctor Who. Oh, that's a, that's a terrible day in history. But the, the lady who who um, was running the show demanded that they replay the first episode, which was never done before. Because oh. they didn't do reruns. Yeah. If you missed an episode, tough luck. Now, was it done live or was it still like pre-recorded? It's pre-recorded, but they would never repeat an episode. Oh, okay. Is but it... she realized it's like, well, JFK just died. Everyone watched that, not our show. So she did the sensible thing and... Demanded the first episode be rerun, and yeah, it kind of just blew up from there. Fifty years strong now. Now I I know there's been quite a few episodes lost because of that because they've never replayed things. Yeah, because in the old days shows didn't have reruns. There was no such thing as home release. So, so you you were telling me that the first time they did renewal, it, it's just completely gone. The episode incorporated with it is lost. But the clip of the Doctor regenerating is still out there and alive. But that's all we have is just the clip. That's, yeah, that that's kind of weird because you would think it's one of the most you know notable things about the show. That's one of the things I knew about Doctor Who before I ever actually had watched it is that they can replace the actor. The fact they don't have the very first one is just wow. Again, it's one of those they... In their minds, they never replay and repeat, so what's the point of keeping them? And plus, there was a fire at the BBC office that destroyed a lot of episodes. Oh, ew. Yeah. Oh, that would... Yeah. So a lot of episodes are still out there. You can probably find most of the original series, like 
a lot of it is on DVD, including the original pilot episode and all that. That's, yeah, no, uh, it, it's one of those things where it's unfortunate to kind of lose, like, a touchstone of pop culture history. Uh, there, there, there's actually quite a lot of lost animation out there, or just things that you, uh, and, like, lost movies and videos. Um, one, one of the, a couple months ago, actually, I fell down the hole of the Lost Media Wiki, where they document all of the different things that there are no copies of. Um, some of the stuff actually has come back. Uh, one of the most uh, not notable ones was this. It aired on Nickelodeon way, way back in the day. It was called Cry Baby Lane. It was a. It was aired during October. It was supposed to be a scary movie, and because they got so many complaints about how scary it was, Nickelodeon never played it again. So it ended up becoming a lost, uh, like a lost uh, movie that no one could find until someone started talking about it actually on Reddit. And someone's like, I think I have the VHS tape there buried somewhere. Let me go find it. And that's how it ended up being released to the web. It's just someone found it randomly because people were asking. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of things. There's actually a cool group of people for Doctor Who do this. Um, in a lot of older cases, audio and video were kept separate. So a lot of old episodes do still, the audio exists. Oh, but so they what, just don't have the video. So what a lot of people have been doing is animating the episode. They find the script, listen to the audio, and do their best to animate an episode. That's really cool. That's something I see within uh, other sci-fi fandoms as well, because that's the whole concept of, uh, well, not the whole similar idea with uh, Star Trek Phase 2, where originally they decided they were going to have additional adventures of the original Enterprise crew. And they had a whole other series written known as Phase 2, but it never actually went to air. But they had a few scripts left over. So uh, a bunch of fans got together and actually started shooting those scripts as new episodes. And some of the stuff was actually reconstituted into the new Star... Like, well, the you know original Star Trek, the motion picture. Um, I believe it was things like V'ger, and that's where uh, Kirk's son was going to come in. And I'm trying to remember the bald lady from... Your, uh, original motion picture. I know who you're talking about. But I uh, yeah, I, I can't remember her character. Uh, but yeah, no, no, she was going to be a part of Phase 2 as well, and they had this whole other uh, plan for it. But then, yeah, the only way it lives on now is just a bunch of fans got together and started filming those scripts. But that's what's cool about the sci-fi fandom is we are that diehard and loyal that we'll go out of our way to keep this alive, even if it was never meant to be. Megan, what about you? I, I know you're feeling terrible. Oh, poor Megan's sick. We, 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 we've, uh, we've, we've wanted to comfort her. So my goal this week was to not die, literally and figuratively. So That should I'm, be your goal most weeks is <laughs> that, that, that should be at least in the top three of your uh, well, the things I have to do this week, you know, <laughs> regular eat, maybe go to the bathroom and not die. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I've been playing a game that's near and dear to my heart. It's called Haunting Ground. I've never heard of it. Now... It's, it's uh, it's obscure. It's out there. It's From so what obscure. I saw you doing with it, it's a dominatrix and a dog running away from um, Bizarro. Oh, wow. Okay, now I'm more interested in this game. The thing is, is you're not a dominatrix. The Why whole not? Game. Okay. okay, listen. Okay. The so, whole game. So you are a dominatrix. You are a dominatrix. <laughs> Only if you beat the game and you p play a new game, you get different costumes. One of them is a Texas cowgirl, the gun... Is really super powered, but it's inaccurate. And then there's illegal in some some states, mm -hmm. which is a dominatrix costume, and you have like a crop, and you like whip the like, whip people. I, I'm more I, I'm more disappointed. There's actually more options because I thought it was going to be like the Metroid thing, where you know if you beat it under five hours, you get to play with you know armorless Samus. It's like oh wow, new game plus. It's just now you're a dominatrix. I know it seems <laughs> it seems a little a little a little lazy. But what? No, 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 no. I, I, I think it's it's fun. It's one of those things. It's like with uh, the second quest with uh, uh, the Wind Waker, where you get to play with in Link's pajamas. What? Yeah, when you beat Wind Waker, you get to play it again in his pajamas. Instead, you never change into the tunic. I didn't know that. Okay, so Haunting Ground is a survival horror game made by Capcom, and it's similar to Clock Tower. Scissor Man. Ah, Clock Tower makes me so angry. It's similar to Clock Tower in the sense that you are running from pursuers. There's people who are trying to hurt you, harm you. You have to run away from them. You're playing as a girl named Fiona, and she was in a car accident with her parents, and her parents are unfortunately deceased. 
and she finds out that she is the only living heir to Belly Castle. Unfortunately, there's people in Belly Castle that want to harm her and steal her life force, and she has to find a way out. So the entire game is you're using your dog companion to fight against your pursuers, hide from them, and find a way out of Belly Castle. Meanwhile, you're trying to fight like six people. That's fun. So, uh, yeah, because survival horror is one of those genres where I've played a bit from it, but I've never played as much as I would like, as, as much as I enjoy parts of the, uh, the genre. I never end up buying the survival horror ones. This one is actually survival survival horror. Like it's it's an early survival horror where you don't have weapons. Um, oh. The ones that you do have are made, and some of them don't work on certain enemies. Yeah, because that's one thing that you'll find with a lot of games that once you get to a certain point, I mean, you're armed to the teeth and you can just go out swinging. I know. Um, the only game I can think that tried, but I think ultimately failed, was Dead Island because they kept making terrible games and awesome promises. <laughs> and yeah, and I, I like that idea with the survival horror where there's consequence and you're not just Rambo. You're just essentially a person and you can die at any time. That's got to be a game, Rambo versus zombies. <laughs> Boom. I would play that. I would too, honestly. That might just be Call of Duty Zombies, though. Okay, let's make mm. Rambo a DLC character then. That I would I would start playing Call of Duty if we did that. You know, <laughs> you just have some inhabit you know super Sylvester Stallone accent. So it's like, hey yo, I'm gonna kill some zombies, and then I will be totally playing Call of Duty, and that's the only way you'll get me into that. Game. I can just imagine like you and a bunch of friends playing, and you're just screaming, "I call dibs on Stallone!" Yes, no, I would play Stallone all of the time, and I would practice a very terrible Stallone accent and be muted by everybody. Can we have a Rambo? Uh, uh, Robocop. Oh. And uh, Terminator. Uh, yeah, that would be that would be much. Why haven't they made that zombie movie? That's <laughs> that's my pitch, movie, movie executives. You know, this we've done Alien versus Predator. You did that, yo, know, Roadhogs movie with Tim Allen and Martin Short, and that was terrible. And you've done so many ensemble movies. Why have when? Oh, I guess I mean you have the Expendables as well, but. I want them in canon now. I want Terminator. I want the T-800. I want old RoboCop. Or maybe new RoboCop. I'm not sure. They'd probably go with new RoboCop. Um, and yeah. Uh, Stallone could still play Rambo. Stallone is still playing Rambo. I'm pretty sure they're making a new one. Or they made a new one. They made a new one a few years ago. It wasn't that bad, actually. Oh, wow. But they kind of went a little crazy with the gore. That you're saying that like it's a bad thing. Here's the thing though, if you watch the first Rambo movie and a lot of people don't remember or realize this, the first one's actually not that violent and there's I think one kill count for the whole movie. What? Yeah, watch the original Rambo. It's not that violent. It's just a bunch of cops who are jerks who want to beat up Rambo because he was in the Vietnam War and arguably that was a pointless war that America just kind of shoehorned into, but it's a really good movie, and it's got one of the most dramatic endings, and actually Stallone's best monologue ever. Like it's a tearjerker moment at the very end. Rewatch Rambo. It's not as bad, not as violent as you remember. Oh wow! That, yeah, because okay. I, I yeah. only saw Rambo when I was young, so I, I remember the movie. I think I was probably twelve when I saw it. I mean, it was one of the movies I loved, but I never actually went back to it as an adult. So I'm, I'm curious. Go now. back to it because, uh, like I said, first off, his ending speech is I say Oscar worthy, and the whole movie is about survival, not killing. Talking about survival. So you <laughs> see how I brought it back. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's definitely one of the things I'm going to have to put on my watch list. I have so many because I missed out on old movies, unfortunately. And my parents were kind of like, no TV, no movies, no stand up past 8 o'clock. Do your homework. Play this violin. Con Junior, why are you not a doctor yet? You know, it's... Uh... <laughs> you talked to me yet? No, Dad. You talked to me one doctor! Oh. Uh, so, uh, now, one of the things I'm actually really excited... Uh, I'm, I'm torn on I'm torn on um, something really exciting happened in Canada but I'm not sure if I care yet because I only found out about this uh, news recently and something that Americans are probably going to be really jealous of us it was a CRT decision CRTC decision 
where they are unbundling cable packages. Woot woot, finally. I know, and it's something people ask for a long time, and it's weird... It's funny that uh, companies had to be forced into this, considering how strong the pull to things like Netflix and you know video on demand are, and a lot of companies are even trying to get into that because you have things like Show Me out there now, which I have no idea what's on, but they're trying at least. Some of them are just so not related either. It's like, oh yeah, so we get the Space Channel and uh, you know Discovery. Oh, and then we get a Sports Channel. It's like what? Well, yeah, that's the thing for me. Like, whenever I was to the point where I cut my cable, I think it was like YTV, much music before it became not music, <laughs> uh, Discovery Channel, Space Channel, and Teletoon. Those were the five things I watched. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for me, uh, as a kid, I think it was YTV, it was Teletoon, um, I'd watch Fox on you know, Sundays and stuff, and then uh, Discovery occasionally sci-fi and the food network because i love watching food porn because the food network yeah where it's at i know it's just you get to watch people make delicious food and not eat it and you go i want to make that and then you try to go with gordon ramsay in the kitchen and your friends make fun and you're like screw it this tastes delicious My i'm putting dill on everything <laughs> My- to be fair that is the best thing to do my previous roommates were like oh why are you watching the food channel it makes me so hungry it's like because i can because I like to watch people make food, okay? I like watching Gordon Ramsay scream at people for 10 minutes, okay? There's one food show that Andrew introduced me to that I'm now hooked on. Oh, which one was that? Cutthroat Kitchen. Oh, Cutthroat Kitchen. <gasps> yes. no, okay, I guess not a nerdy topic, but it is an amazing thing to watch. The entire concept behind Cutthroat Kitchen is they give each of the contestants $25,000. And they are all assigned to make something with food. And then they have to bid on sabotaging the other players with things like, oh, you have to cook all of your food in this pan that has no bottom, or you have to cook it in this pipe. And My favorite you- was, uh, you have to make an Italian sub, but your bread is dipped in water. Oh. Yeah, uh, you have to make a salad, but you know you have these gummy worms instead. Insane, crazy sabotages, and you get—it's—it's it's one of those shows that delights in its, uh, its spitefulness, but it's a lot of fun to watch. My favorite one was, my favorite one was when they replaced somebody's bananas with banana candies. Oh, ew. but with the thing with the decision now is. Uh, they're going to have a basic package, 25 bucks a month flat rate. So they're actually regulating that, that you have to have this, these basic networks included. But from there, people can actually pick and choose their channels and create their own packages. There's been upsides and downsides to this, though. Because of that, there were networks that were carried just because they were included in a package. Um, one of those being Teletoon Retro. So Teletoon Retro would play all of the older cartoons and, you know, classic uh, from, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. But Chorus, who owns it, realized, well, if we unbundle this, that viewership is going to drop like a rock because we don't see people choosing that channel. The main thing that suffers when uh, bundles would be unpackaged would be children's television because a lot of people won't pick it up who don't have kids. Thus, less funding goes to the network. However, turns out, and I didn't know this, Canada has had Cartoon Network since 2012. Yeah. Yeah. So what they're going to be doing is they're going to be moving Cartoon Network into all of Teletoon Retro's uh, old slots and then moving the Cartoon Network uh, content from Teletoon just over to their new Canada Cartoon Network. I'm not sure if it's too little too late because I always wanted Cartoon Network as a kid. And I guess this is still, you know, Canadian discount Cartoon Network. But usually when they, like, uh, relaunch a channel, which I guess this would be sort of a soft relaunch, they bring back a lot of the old shows. That's what they did when uh, Nickelodeon Canada came in. It was just, you know, marathons of Angry Beavers, and I was very, very happy. Well, yeah, Angry Beavers is the most Canadian show I could think of. Now, speaking of, uh, speaking of Nickelodeon, a uh, clever segue. There's been an interesting development. It was the president of content development at Nickelodeon. Uh, they are getting ring of, uh, bring back some of their old shows, and some of the, they said specifically... Ones we've been asked multiple times to be brought back. So I've been wondering what they're going to bring back. Because we have all these shows from Nickelodeon when we were kids that uh, really left an imprint on us or is an intrinsical part of our childhood. Things like Rugrats, Rocko Smart in Life, Hey Arnold, Angry Beavers, Invader Zim. What, my question to you folks. Which classic Nickelodeon cartoon would you like them to bring back? Hands down, Rocko's Modern Life. Same. And... 
I think if they did it, they would bring it back as an actual adult cartoon. Well, the thing is, a lot of the quote-unquote adult humor can still be in there without uh, kids realizing it, like the whole thing about Rocco working at a sex line. Yeah, I know, and I went back and watched Rocco's Modern Life uh, as an adult, and I did not... I. I now look at him like, I'm not sure what I enjoyed as a kid because everything I find funny, I would not have understood. And uh, they had a whole musical episode, of course. I'm always addicted to musicals when they break out into episodes <laughs> where it's all about, you know, fighting corporate America and City Hall and they have this huge tongue-in-cheek uh, aspect of it. It's like, how do you guys know the choreography? It's like, weren't you on practice? You know, weren't you there on practice on Tuesday? It's like, there was practice? And they acknowledge that, you know, this was a whole elaborate thing and it becomes meta humor before meta humor was, you know, so really a thing and that was really in the mainstream that we saw within kid or kids' cartoons. See, now I'm sad that I missed out on this show because that was one of the shows that I didn't know about from Nickelodeon. All the other shows that from Nickelodeon, I don't like them. You don't. I just don't. I mean... You need to sit down and watch Avatar The Last Airbender. I like Spongebob. The, I love Spongebob. You, you like pre-movie Spongebob or post-movie Spongebob? All the Spongebob. That's the incorrect answer. All the Spongebob. I really like the pre-movie the pre, the pre Spongebob episodes, but the uh, post-Spongebob movie episodes are not too bad. Uh, I, I couldn't do it. Hasselhoff's pro- butt. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's always that. For me, there's another thing that... Because they never said cartoons. Everyone's always going to assume cartoons with Nickelodeon, but cartoons are expensive. There's a couple other things that people have asked Nickelodeon to bring back, and it's something that uh, actually I noted during our live show they haven't really done in a long time. It's... The Amanda Show. No. Oh, God, no! <laughs> now, that would be an interesting late-night take for Nickelodeon, bringing back Amanda Bynes now after she's crazy, so it would just be, Hey, watch me snort cocaine, kids! <laughs> <laughs> That's more for Spike TV, but... Admit, part of you now wants to see that. I kind of do want to see the Trainwreck Amanda show. Because, I mean, Drake Bell's not doing anything. He's like, you know, $500,000 in debt. Um, Josh Parker, I think, is actually successful, so they can't bring him back. But, yeah. But they could if maybe he would want to. Maybe he would want to. And especially, I mean, Drake Bell really needs the money. So he's going to turn into Nick Cage now. Where he'll take any role. So, huh. I don't know what was more entertaining, listening to you say that or watching you say that. That was was the best. Well, a light bulb turned on there. Well, what I'll do is I'll announce what I think they should bring back right after this break. Folks, of course, you're listening to 102.7 FM, CILU, or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. We are your Thunder Geeks. Welcome back to CILU 102.7 FM or around the world at luradio.ca. That was Weird Al Yankovic with All About the Pentiums. I absolutely love that song. I love all of Weird Al. I do too. Running With Scissors has a special place in my heart because that's really the album I discovered Weird Al with. Um, And... I also realized that they had a lot of Weird Al albums at the library, and I had a library card and could take out as many as I want. I constantly had Running With Scissors. I used to fall asleep to that album every single night from like age uh, probably 12 to 13, 14 ish, probably. So, a good year and a half, I'm listening to this album pretty much every day. This sounds like a romantic relationship. Well, Weird Al is very romantic. It, it definitely is a romantic relationship. I discovered myself to Weird Al. I discovered my musical taste to Weird Al, to be honest, because before I watched TV, because my parents were really strict, I found my sister's Weird Al CDs. Oh. And I would listen to them and start humming the songs, and my sister would be like, oh, you, listen, oh, you like uh, Smells Like Teen Spirit? I'm like, what smells like Teen Spirit? I know it smells like Nirvana. <laughs> so that's how I got like into Nirvana, and then into Michael Jackson, and into all these other artists. You went in reverse. Exactly. Now, before the break, I was talking about what I think they should bring back. Now, it's not only from a perspective of, it might do well, but more importantly, it would be super cheap to produce. Nickelodeon used to do these awesome game shows as a kid. So they did things like Double Dare, they did things like Guts, which I absolutely loved. Um, Guts was kind of like a sports competition where 
instead of a regular sport like playing dodgeball, they'd put them all on bungee cords, so they'd be jumping, you know, 30 feet in the air and just hucking balls at each other. They have the big rock wall, and it was a lot of fun to watch. Or uh, Legends of the Hidden Temple, where it was like half educational and half, uh, you know, uh, athleticism. Now, I know the reason a lot of those shows were on is because they'd always throw a trivia portion in there, so it uh, got the EI content that was you know required for television back then, not so much now. But I think if they reworked the shows, they could work, and I mean, instead of doing another live-action, terrible, we-want-to-be-the-Disney-channel-so-bad you know, show, do, you know, do something fun and that we haven't seen in a long time. And remember the slime. You can never forget the slime. Hmm. Well, Nickelodeon slime. slime. Oh, the slime. I thought you said this line, and I was no, very confused. The slime. I was expecting a line here, and now I'm disappointed. I wanted a quote. Give me a quote, Rob. You have no quotes. I gave you a quote from Silent Bob. Oh, okay. <laughs> Touche, sir. Touche. You spoke to my heart. Go pack your things. I never want to see you again. And quickly, name drop. Oh. Oh. Yes, I have met Kevin Smith. For those of you that don't know, every episode we try to go without talking about anyone that Rob has met. I don't know if this one counts because you did bring him up, but that was very quick on your feet. We work Clutter. again to thwart the name droppers. Horrible antics. There was this show on YTV, I think it was, and it was like a Japanese game show for kids. I'd like to see some more of that. Wait, wait, wait. When you say Japanese game show... I mean Japanese game show. I'm thinking like MXE. Yeah, so I mean... Wh- it is... Uh, well, what was it called? I'm completely unaware of it. Um, I don't remember what it was called. Aww. Uh, but it, it, they, they do the The incredibly show. forgettable game show. It's like... You mean uh-oh? No, it no. was not uh-oh. Oh, okay. It, it, and the, it, was like, it has like three words, the intro, and they yell it out. And it's like... It was really fun. And... I don't know. Some of some of the some of the games were just so ridiculous. I only remember one YTV game show, and that was Video in Our Top Ten. Uh, there was it's it's alive, which had the precursor to Uh Oh, um, Uh Oh itself, uh, Video in Game, uh, Video in Arcade Top Ten, and they had there was another one I remember. I vaguely was uh oh the one with the slime uh oh was the one with the slime okay. and looking back at the Punisher with whole new context. Wow. What? The con- the Punisher was just done up in bondage gear. He had like a gimp mask on. Oh! Yeah, he would pick the kid up and put him in the chamber, then dump him with his spl- slime. I have a whole new context now while thinking about that. That is- Oh my god! Yeah! My childhood! What? I have- I was thinking like Frank Castle Punisher, and I- that just gave me- That's why it's called Uh Oh. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You are a terrible man. I know. I know. I want to talk about something I'm really excited about. I have I've talked about it a couple times before. I am really pumped for Rock Band 4. Rock Band has been and Harmonix's game has been I I've been invested in this game since the very first time I put the hands on Guitar Hero the original one. They had this little display at Future Shop. I picked it up, I played a couple songs, and I bought the entire game. I dropped 80 bucks right there because I love rhythm games. It was sad that there was sort of the rhythm game bubble bust because Activision put out way too many games, as Activision does. But Rock Band 4 is coming back. Get to use my old instruments. I am probably going to buy new ones anyways. And all my old DLC will still be there. Did you like Parappa the Rapper? I loved Parappa the Rapper. Oh, kick punch. It's all in the mind. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, uh, uh, rhythm games have always been you know, near and dear to my heart. It's one of those things where it's not only a test of your reaction time, it's a test of your rhythm, it's a test of your athletics with some games like ITG and DDR. I, I remember you DDRing at Ron's when it was still a thing and like... After a few rounds, you're just drenched. Yeah, that's when I used to be super in shape. Uh, me and my sister would play, go to DDR and play for hours. And in the beginning, when you still stepped on the pad too hard, I distinctly remember having my uh, shoes come out back red. So, yeah, when you when you DDR, DDR, you DDR hardcore. Because me and my me and my cousin, we used to cheat because we didn't have the pad, the dance pad. Oh. So we just used the controller. And this is so silly because. I'm really good at DDR on the controller, mm-hmm. and I can't 
do the thing from the haunting ground. You watched me do it, Rob. Oh, there was like a like a reaction time. Yeah, portion. you make items this way. It's a reaction time. It spins and then you press and it hits colors. I suck at that thing, but I'm really good at DDR. And it doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> it's because with the DDR, you see the arrows coming up from the bottom. With your thing, it's just things flying at you. <laughs> Like, if I threw some at you from 10 feet away, I'm sure you'd be able to stop it quicker than if I threw it just at your face from this distance. We should test that, Rob. Okay. That's our new Megan experiment. We've been thinking of things to take out of context and make an experiment. So, Megan, we're going to try to throw something at 10 feet away and then something really close, and we'll see which one you can't catch. Megan's also thought of an experiment when you weren't there about you and me having a fight in a pile of bananas. <gasps> oh, the banana fight! <laughs> I, I am intrigued. <laughs> Tell me about this banana fight. Okay. Now, first, what's the context of this, Megan? How did you think of a banana fight? <laughs> okay, so it all started with the fact that the hypothesis if, you know, my boyfriend and I ever broke up, the joke would be that you and Robert would fight over him. Yes, that's <laughs> completely true. Okay. <laughs> and But the thing is, is I was like, ooh, yeah, I was like, yeah, I could get into that, you know? Because you know how girls are like at bars, they get into mud fights and you like put bets on like who who would win. I was like, we could do that same thing, except I want bananas. I want unpeeled bananas. And you put them all in a, in a like a pit and then you guys get in there and fight. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this was a very elaborate thought, Megan. I'm not sure if we're flattered, hilarious, or sort of. Oh come on! It'll... I'm go. I, I'm. Uh, hey, I'm not saying I won't do it because I totally would, and I think I would win. We still have this ongoing contest here. I don't remember. Uh, I think you're one up on me now. Yeah, because you have. I, I have the inner, the in ball racing. Yep. You have the jousting. And what else did you beat me at? There was a third competition recently. Explodey Kittens. You beat me Explodey Kittens, but I beat you at the wizard battle. We are tied, sir. So we need a new challenge. So, uh... The banana fight, I guess. Yeah, we're, we're gonna need some bananas donated to us, and we're gonna... F okay, how do we do this with, like, safety protection now? Okay, um, I guess... I was just thinking we do it in kitty pool. That's what I was thinking. We could get, like, a larger inflatable kitty pool. Okay. Put it out on the lawn. You guys can wear, like, little helmets or something. And that's Oh, it. I'm going full costume here. If we're going to battle, we are going to <laughs> battle. Don't forget the elbow pads. Elbow pads and spikes. Mm. <laughs> no, that's not allowed. Now, now, I was talking about Rock Band there because they were actually doing this really cool contest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the, the roads we travel down sometimes from Rock Band to Banana Fights only here on Thunder Geeks. But Rock Band, they're actually got this contest going on. I'm so excited for it. I have one of my bandmates set already, my, my bestie Nessa out there, our mysterious listener. And we have been planning our band name. We have been planning. We have actually planned our entire band theoretical career after the cover songs and we've started you know <laughs> naming our random albums are you guys idols in we're, your in your fantasy we're, we're not uh, we're not idols we're we're definitely we're definitely a hipster band we're called goblin nuts <laughs> 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 uh, but rock band i i think goblin nuts has to we're gonna have to get our uh, other two bandmates going Maybe you guys, but you're gonna have to audition because Goblin Nuts takes this super seriously because it's all about the music, bro. And you get to submit a video of you guys playing rock band with your friends. All you have to do is say impressive solo. And if you make it upon uh, into their auditions, they, uh, you get a lot of free content. You get to do challenges with them. And it sounds like a lot of fun. They'll give you free DLC. And I like not paying for things. <laughs> Free DLC would be one of the things that actually motivates me to do this. Especially with Rock Band, because with Rock Band, DLC makes sense. Because you're paying for more songs. You're taking a game and you're adding more of what you want onto it. Not having a game that should have had this content on release, but they're just charging you extra because they can and will still pay for it. Horse armor. <laughs> I was thinking more or less Mortal Kombat. That too. Oh, DL DLC gets crazy sometimes. So Rock Band has always been really cool about the DLC, and that's one thing I'm very excited about, that I still get to play all of my old songs because I have spent an obnoxious amount of money on this game. So you can import your songs from other games into this one? 
Yes, yes. Um, uh, that's something that Rock Band's been really cool about. Harmonix has been really cool about. From Rock Band 1 to Rock Band 2 to Rock Band 2 to Rock Band 3, you've always been able to pay a flat fee to cover the licensing fee and transfer the older songs, not just your DLC, but the older songs from the games into the newer games and expand your set list. So with this one, you're going to have a bunch of new songs plus all of the old songs, and they're also revamping all of these single player as well. But it's gonna be October. Um, I need to find myself. Probably, rather, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, I need a bassist or a lead guitarist because those two all fight over it. But Goblin Nuts will be looking. And a drummer, right? I'm the drummer. Oh, I'm you're the drummer. I am the drummer. Funny story about that because what happened was when Rock Band got released, <laughs> um, it got delayed in Canada. It got delayed in Canada for a dumb reason, but a dumb reason that EA should have known about. In Canada, we of course have the language laws where you have to have French and English on the package. You know what they forgot to put on the package? English. <laughs> no, that actually happens sometimes, and I think it's okay if they do, but they forgot to put French on the package. Um, weird insert. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memory only came with a French instruction booklet in Canada for some reason, so that does happen. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah, no, there was no English, uh, when I bought the game, there was no English instruction manual, it just came with a French one. But does does the game, like, you can play it and it's fine? Oh yeah, it's still in English, oh. they, they didn't just put a French version <laughs> over here. But with Rock Band, they did not put French on the package, so it got delayed in Canada for two months, and... Of pure coincidence, uh, someone I knew that I was working with was going over the border <laughs> during the launch of Rock Band. So I went to him and I'm like, if I give you, you know, a hundred bucks plus, you know, some for gas, will you pick up this game for me? I'm sorry, it's obnoxiously huge, but bring it over the border. And he actually brought it for a few people. Though the original guitar run was all broken. So I couldn't play guitar. So I've been, you know, playing the first two uh, guitar heroes that it's the only instrument I had played. So I could rather sing or play drums. I am not a singer, so I played drums, and I had so much fun with it, I never went back. And now I don't have to fight over uh, lead guitar and bass, it's the greatest. Everyone always needs a drummer. Have you tried to sing, though, at least? It's not, it's not okay. too hard. Okay, okay, no, no, it's... I, I've heard it, no, 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 no. It, it, it's... I, I can do Beastie Boys, though, because I could just rap, and... Oh, okay. It, not well, but I will still try to do Beastie Boys, though I found out you can also meow to the same beat in the first game, and I did Beastie Boys just by meowing into the microphone. That's amazing. I am proud of you for that, actually. <laughs> and because right now we're talking about rock bands, there's one rock band I have to quickly drop. Ooh. Um, Peter Capaldi, the current doctor, and Craig Ferguson, the former host of The Late Show, were apparently in a punk rock band several decades ago called The Dream Boys. That is not an expected name for a, 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 a punk band. Well, the funny thing is... That sounds are... more like a boy band, and I would still be okay with that. I want to see a Doctor Who boy band, you know? Uh, they can be back through time. Well, the thing is, their original name I can't say on air. Cause, oh! Yeah. Backstreet back through time? No, no. The um, Dream Boys' original name was the... I'm going to use the literal translation. The Unmarried Children's from Hell. Ooh! I like that one. It sounds much better than Dream Boys. Well, the thing is, he was going through an artsy phase and thought it meant deeper and more significant things. Uh, I actually, b a funny story uh, about, you know, famous uh, <laughs> British, uh, you know, geek uh, icons. Grant Morrison was actually in a punk band. So that, and that's what he started out with, uh, where he was drawing on the side there, but he actually, you know, had a music career and he had to decide, do I want to keep going with music or do I want to go into this comic book thing? And he decided to go with the comic books. Good choice. You know what I'm disappointed about? Constantine used to have a punk band. Oh. That, and in the comics, there's one of his videos, like a music video. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like an entire chapter or whatever. It's a music video of his song. And I was really hoping that that would come into the show. Well, maybe we'll see that in season four of Arrow. I doubt it. I highly doubt that that Constantine is going to be in a punk. We're going to see the Constantine's punk band. You never know. They could do it as like a, maybe a DVD extra as like a deleted scene. What this tells us, at least with Constantine, to give you hope, Megan, because I know I have tried to destroy your hope over and over. You because, are so mean. Because I am a mean, evil person who delights in pain. But now both all of us have seen the new season four trailer. Constantine, yeah, Matt Ryan's in there, and it shows us that he still wants to play the character. And CW might 
maybe one day take the plunge. We'll see. Because iZombie is coming back for its second season soon. Uh, and I, I'm very excited to see what's going to come out from that. Uh, Arrow Season 4, Flash Season 2. And then we have Legends of Tomorrow. If all of these shows and the superhero bubble keeps growing and does not bust yet, be as Steven Spielberg is predicting, which I really hope not. I want my superhero movies. No more Batman and Robins. Please, no Batman and Robins. No Batman and Robins. Stop. And... Yeah, we maybe we'll get Constantine back. Let's be honest here. Geeks run the world right now. Definitely. We run the world. We run the economy. Okay? For better, for worse. <laughs> well, yeah, if you look at, like, any convention. Yeah. We're there dropping money, like, oh, God, I'm, financially speaking, I'm so glad I missed Fan Expo. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, uh, fa yeah, Fan Expo's happening right now, isn't yeah. it? What, what what did you miss at Fan Expo? The only, funny enough, bec because I'm such a name dropper, I actually looked through the catalog of people who are going to be there. Three people I'm interested in seeing. Oh, okay, so that's not so bad. No, it's uh, Danny Trejo, uh, Billy Piper, who is a companion of the Doctor, mm -hmm. and George A. Romero. I would be actually pretty excited to meet uh, Danny Trejo because he's he's a character in Fallout New Vegas, and I'd be like. I would bring he him a picture. He himself is a character. I would bring him a picture of his ghoul this, in, a, in a jumpsuit, and I'd be like, please sign, please. Now, I got a funny story here, and I absolutely love this. This came out on the internet. Now, uh, I think it was about a month ago. There was this story going around about Batman v Superman. Now, this is a movie I've been expressing great concern about because I don't trust Zack Snyder. I know a lot of people are on board with it. Every trailer they show, I'm excited for, and I'm still... I've been hurt before, and I'm hesitant to make a commitment again, so... Do as I do, and be cautiously optimistic. I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be. But there was one story that had me really, really worried, and it came from uh, uh, the actor who was playing Zod. So, what he had said, he had given this story that he was, did a few scenes, and he was having trouble opening the door, because he got stuck in a bathroom, because he had these flippers on his hands. And everyone's like, why does Zod have flippers? <laughs> Why? I mean, we've seen him in the trailer, so we know maybe it's a flashback, but well, no. Turns out he was just messing with everybody. Uh, he had been asked so many times about Batman v Superman, he hasn't actually even been on the set. Uh, and he said it's even weird because uh, he's in a movie he was never actually in. He did some voice lines for it, but that's it. He knows nothing about what's going on, but people keep asking him questions. So he sarcastically gave this answer, and nobody got the joke. It's kind of like Benedict Cumberbatch. He, he was his, the voice of Smaug. Oh, no, he actually was the... He was actually... He did the motion. He did the, the motion capture. The as motion well. capture for Smog. I forgot about that. But yeah, he's not actually in the movie. He's he's portraying. Yeah, he's a just dragon. portraying. Just yeah. portray well, I mean, when it's a CGI character, yeah, <laughs> you know, you're lending your voice talents, and that's actually as far as Zod uh, says that he's in as well as he. I just recorded a couple voice lines, but I'm not actually in the movie. So hmm, that's strange. See, I would have messed with people even more. I wouldn't have told them that. <laughs> Oh, that's been done for a few movies. I think probably the most infamous one was Scream 3, where they started leaking fake scripts out to the internet just to throw people off what the real story was. And, well, the real story just turned out to be kind of okay, but it's still a cool marketing tactic when you, you know, also, start... Also, Gravity Falls, the whole uh, red herring of Mr. McGucket being the author. Yes, Alex Hirsch did that as well, where uh, one of the big questions of Gravity Falls is, who is the author? And if you haven't watched Gravity Falls yet, you definitely should. But there's this one crazy old character called Old Man McGucket. And you find out the reason he's old and crazy is because he was involved with a lot of these experiments with the paranormal. And they started implying that he was the author. And Alex Hirsch, the creator of the show, tweeted out and then deleted quickly a tweet of Old Man McGucket writing the journal. Just to mess with people. Just to mess with all the people speculating on what it could possibly be. I like these people who are like, fake out, you know. If you can fake out your audience, you're doing a pretty good job, I think. And it, it's something I think, yeah, you might have to do these days because you have all of these people on the internet that come up with these wild outlandish theories and some really cool ones that when you read them and you then watch the show, you're then disappointed about what actually is in there because you have this, you know, giant machine just 
constantly generating new ideas. That's but why I don't really like talking about theory, especially in uh, Steven Universe. Oh, I would, definitely not. I would just like to watch the show and enjoy it as it comes and have those <gasps> no way moments. But the funny thing is in Gravity Falls, they did have an episode just recently where they make fun of the theory fact. Yes, yes, like, Seuss. Um, uh, Seuss has the line where, if this doesn't line up with my fan fiction, I'm going to be greatly disappointed. <laughs> Not only that, but in the episode Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons, featuring yes. Weird Al. Yes, yes. Um, at the very end of the episode, they're watching a, they're watching a TV show called Duck Detective, and it has the same twist ending that Gravity Falls had, and they're making snarky replies to it, kind of like the audience did. <laughs> and that's fun to do and I like when you know creators are aware of you know their criticisms and you know even get to have fun with it and play with it and saying you know I'm still going to do what I'm doing and I know that for some of you I am never going to live up to your wild theories because you come up with some great ones and you come up with some crazy ones there's an episode of Steven Universe that's kind of just out there it's the, the, the episode of Uncle Grandpa I skipped that episode. That I was went, not canon. Yep. I went right. five <laughs> seconds in I because uh, I have heard of Uncle Grandpa. I'd never watched it before. The moan, I'm like, you know, just noped right out of that into the next episode. So what Uncle Grandpa ends up doing is um, Stephen says something, and he's like, don't worry, son, this isn't canon. And he pulls a cannon out of his back or something or his pocket, and he's like, but this is. And he plops this cannon down. He takes his head off, puts it in the cannon, and then fires the head out to sea. Nope. The sea, the sea <laughs> hits a ship, and um, Lars and Sadie are on the ship, and it starts sinking. And he's like, no, our ship! Oh. <laughs> I'm growing. I'm, I enjoy it. I enjoy it slightly. Not enough to watch the Uncle Grandpa episode yet. That's the only part of the Uncle oh. Grandpa episode that I enjoyed. I watched the, up to that point, and then I stopped. Well, it was just supposed to be an April Fool's joke. Yep. Actually, one other thing that I'm excited about, so more movie news coming out. Uh, now, we've been talking about the female Ghostbusters, and I'm pretty excited to see with the cast that they have what they're going to do with this franchise. And one thing that we thought would never happen, Bill Murray coming back to be in Ghostbusters. Because that, that's, oh, that's part of the big reasons why a Ghostbusters 3 never happened. Bill Murray's like, I'm not going to do it. I don't think it's going to be funny. I think we're milking the franchise. Uh, but he decided to do a really cool thing. Um, Maybe he read the script and thought it was hilarious. Not only that, um, he came to do a cameo. Now, it's not as Peter Venkman. He's actually going to be doing a smaller role. And it's very, very self-referential where he's going to be trying to debunk the new Ghostbusters team. So he's going to be a dissenter. And uh, the reason he said he's going to be doing it is that he wanted people to not judge it based on him not doing Ghostbusters 3 because he realized that a lot of people are going to give this uh, movie the short end of the stick and if somebody gave it a bad review thinking that he disapproved of it existing, um, he didn't want that. He wanted them to have a legitimate chance to make a good movie. It's not just about him and I think that's such, it's not only a cool thing to do, it also opens up if this thing explodes, maybe he will come back. Because, I mean, if you give a really big check in front of him after it's been successful, we can have the Avengers of the Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, my problem is with this movie is there's a lot of people who are like, but why are they all girls? Why are they all girls? Why are they all girls? Why were they all men at the beginning? Why were they all men at the beginning? And it's like, I don't want to get all, you know, angry about this, but it's just like, oh, look, women who are doing their jobs existing. Oh, the, no. Here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. There are legitimate people who are, you know, mean that, and, yeah, we can dismiss and condemn them because we know not to take them serious. But you also have to realize there is a much larger portion of people on the Internet that are saying that to make you angry. That is true. You always have to factor in the troll factor because there's always going to be people out there where they're getting the rise just by making you angry and wasting your time and getting into argument and saying the most outlandish things to get you to react. Rabble, 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 rabble. You don't feed the trolls. I mean, trolls be trolling. Trolls are going to troll. The only way to do it is just to move on and ignore it. And if you feed back into it, you're just gonna, you know, feed the beast. I'm excited for this movie because... I've loved everything Melissa McCarthy has done so far. Yes. She's an amazing actress. Um, I'm excited for Spy coming out in a couple, uh, I think next, 
It's rather later in the month or next month here. It's coming out soon. I can't wait to see her as a super spy. <laughs> this is like a James Bond character. This is going to be awesome. Absolutely amazing. She has been hilarious in everything. I think her best is in The Heat. Yes. I could not stop laughing for the scary enough reason of her character reminds me of my own mother. Wow. That's, that's you, a you little know, concerning. You know, you know the scene where she's hanging the kid above like a car just holding him over the stairs? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, my oh. God. There's on, wait, on that note, we're going to go to our next break here. Thank you, folks. You're listening to 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at luradio.ca. And we're back. Of course, that was Wish I Had a Portal Gun by College Humor, and you're listening to 102.7 FM, C-I-L-U, or around the world at luradio.ca, or your Thunder Geeks. Now... Let's talk about one more thing before we get to the main event, because we saw Turbo Kid this week, and oh, it is absolutely amazing. But I got one thing I'm a little bit concerned about, so let's talk about the concern before the good stuff. Andrew, I told you, you gotta go see a doctor about that, so I'm taking <laughs> off your pants in studio. Well, it's, sometimes it's a little warm and a little sexy, and I kept thinking about that banana fight, and that's how <laughs> things happen. <laughs> But Marvel Studios is doing this big shakeup, and I don't know how to take it. Um, Marvel, since the formation with Iron Man and building their universe, has had this thing known as the Creative Committee, um, where it's had people from the studio, comic book writers, um, people like uh, Joe Casada and uh, you know Brian Michael Bendis, uh, all headed by Kevin Feige, saying. You know, directing what the things in the Marvel Universe are going to be, working out the creative details of it, working out the science of it, and keeping things on point. And for the most part, it's worked very well. Not Iron Man 3, but for the rest of it, they've kept things straight. They are dissolving that committee. Well, the thing is, uh, hear me out, what if they're already done scripting and everything and the committee is no longer relative? Well, they still have movies beyond where the committee will go. The last one they think that it'll have input upon is uh, Doctor Strange. And what at, what apparently happened, and I'm not sure which way this goes, is uh, Kevin Feige was supposedly, you know, rumored to be threatening to quit Marvel because of all the fights they had over the budget with uh, Captain America Civil War. Because this is going to be an expensive movie. I'm just imagining a room some, similar to what, what Congress looks like, and all these people wearing different, you know, superhero logos on their shoes, going, Ravel, 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 Ravel! Yeah, that's essentially, I think, what it was. Um, and one of the complaints is that they got too into the nitty-gritty science of how things worked. And now, my thing is, is that I want them to get into the nitty-gritty science and make sure things make sense. I know that's going to frustrate screenwriters, but continuity matters. Uh, I, I don't want to be tricked into not noticing a plot hole i want there not to be a plot hole if there doesn't have to be let's face it geeks run the world right now and one thing that geeks do is we nitpick oh, at yeah. shows we, and we will always find plot holes that's exactly. the problem i have with iron man 3 where the casual viewing audience just sees this fun movie i'm like why does the, the president feel himself I mean, free himself Feel Himself is a very different movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> why doesn't the president free himself in Iron Man 3 if he's in the fully functional Iron Patriot suit? That doesn't make sense at all. At all. And it was stuff like that that bugged me about that movie so much I ended up not enjoying it overall. Um, what's going to be happening is Kevin Feige is going to be reporting directly to Disney. So this could be good or this could be bad because Marvel has still had their independence from Disney for the most part where Disney's been putting up the funding and we've still had these great movies coming out. And also a part of the fight was as well is that's why Edgar Wright actually left is because they were fighting over the nitty gritty over Ant-Man and Edgar Wright you know, didn't care. The thing is I ended up liking the Ant-Man movie that came out so... Have you seen the alternate Ant-Man preview? Yes, we, we posted that on the Thunder Geeks page where they're hand-boning. <laughs> Ants! 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 <laughs> and they did absolutely fantastic, so we'll have to wait and see, but I mean, do you guys have any thoughts? Do you think this is going to be good? Do you guys think this is going to be bad? Or Well, for one, I can kind of understand why Captain America is going over budget. It's pretty much Avengers 2.5. Yeah, and the problem is is that it's Avengers 2.5 without the Avengers name. It's Captain America's name. Winter Soldier did well, but it didn't do Avengers numbers. So can it have an Avengers budget? Well, again, it sh- 
I don't think you should have an Avengers budget. I didn't even... I don't know why they chose Civil War as the story to go with Captain America 3. Yeah, it's a little strange. I honestly, my theory was because they introduced Bucky, they were going to have the death of Captain America and Bucky, like in the comics, taking up the mantle. Uh, it'll actually be interesting to see which way they go because at the very least, Chris Evans actually recently came out and said that as long as they want him to do Captain America, he will continue to do it even after his contract because he absolutely loves playing the role of Steve Rogers. And he he describes the Marvel movies like a playground where he gets to go in and work with all these great people and has fun every time and he kicks himself. He's like, look at my filmography. I don't know why I ever questioned going into this movie. I was in lots of terrible movies before, and all of the ones coming out of Marvel I've been in have been amazing to work on and amazing to watch. I just want to see more Chris Evans as Same. Captain America. With a banana up his butt. Um, no, I just want to, I want to see Chris Evans as Captain America. And, oh, I forgot what his name was in that movie. In the, in the Losers. That was a good movie, yeah. Well, a cool thing about Chris Evans as Captain America, I, I love this little tidbit. After the Avengers finished filming the New, New York disaster fight scene, there's a lot of videos and pictures of him just helping out clean up. Cause That's they, such a cool thing to do. Yeah, because they were short-staffed for cleaning, so he's like, well, I'm done, so here, sweep, sweep, sweep. It's always nice when, after people get super famous, that they still manage to be humble and still manage to be real people. I'd love to see him do that in the Captain America suit with just, like, he a was. broom. He was. Like, <laughs> after they yelled, cut. And that's just, that's just an, that's an iconic shot of Captain America. He's helping the working man. It, yep. Which, to me, is, like, the perfect blend of character and actor. Now... Let's talk about the big movie we watched this week, Turbo Kid, and a bit of history behind it first, because Turbo Kid has a start in a movie we've been talking about since episode one of Thunder Geeks, even before Thunder Geeks. Uh, I have talked about this movie over and over again Mr. to the point Apostle. where people are sick of me. Uh, no, no, no. ABCs of Death. It is one of my favorite movies out there. Watch it on Netflix if you haven't. I'm not saying it's a good movie. I'm saying it's an experience you'll never forget. Now... With ABCs of Death, it is a movie where they have 26 different directors, and they have 26 different letters, and each director gets assigned a letter, except for one that is opened up to the public, and they can submit their own movies. For the first movie, it was the letter T, and the, the short that one was T for Toilet, and it was this really cool uh, claymation, um, show, uh, claymation short. short. I was Yeah, I said short, and I was looking for the word short where they have the toilet kill them. But there was another submission, T for Turbo, which is where Turbo Kid starts. Turbo Kid is the story of the post-apocalyptic wasteland of 1997. It is amazing what this movie pulls off, and it's actually Canadian, too. So, I mean, Canada strong. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about the plot of uh, Turbo Kid. It's a post-apocalyptic future where everyone rides bikes and collects scrap metals and other things to make their bikes better and trade for water. It's basically Mad Max on bikes. Essentially, and it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, and of course, with the, you know, the apocalypse, which was caused by robots, uh, there is a big shortage of water. So whoever controls water controls you know the land. And that's where our big bad comes in, where he controls the water and... Played by Michael Ironside. Played by Michael Ironside. And he's the only really big name actor in this movie. The all, all the other ones are complete unknowns, but they did so well in their roles. Um, Turbo Kid and Apple were probably my favorite, the, the main characters they had. Uh, Apple was hilarious, and I swear she was having a blast the entire time acting. Wouldn't you, though, if that was your character? Yeah, I would like... Like, she did go all out and have fun. Just go, like... Cuckoo? I was going to say Shatner levels. <laughs> the thing with Apple is, Apple is a character that I know. I know people like Apple. Apple is very... Socially awkward? Socially awkward. She's very expressive. She's very positive. And th there's, you know, there's some people you get uncomfortable because she'll be really close to you and stuff. But, you know, when you get used to her quirk, she's a lot of fun. However, I've never seen 
a character like Apple on screen. In a positive light. In There's a, one in a negative light starring Jim Carrey as the cable guy. The, yes, the cable guy. But no, uh, she is a hero. She is socially awkward, and but she is still you know a lot of fun to follow. She's probably one of my favorite characters in this story. I think I realize now who she reminds you of, and I, I get it. I get it now. As we both look at Megan. I'm confused. No, well, no, 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 no. Apple. Apple? Like your bestie. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, that's, no, no. That's different. That's different. Oh, okay. What do you mean? I'm not like her? <laughs> oh, well. I give you no personal space, I, and I'm always optimistic and cheerful. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about one of my favorite things about the movie here is the gore. This is a movie that very low budget, and uh, they use their budget very smart because they, uh, they always film, you know, within what looks like sort of construction sites so it has that you know broken look there's a lot of pits and a lot of desolate wastelands they get a lot of good shots out of this but where all the money for the movie seems to go is in how they decide to kill other people and wow blood fountains everywhere I know my favorite kill from the movie is the death totem pole that appeared in the original Turbo Kid short and they revamp it and up the odds for the uh, for the final fight here. Rob, uh, what would you say is your favorite kill in the movie? It was definitely the bicycle intestine pole because I have never seen that cinematically speaking. I also love the just because of the build up to it. It's like they're torturing this guy, and he just instantly gives the information, and the bad guy's just like. Huh. Well, we put so much effort into this. It'd be a waste not to. Exactly. He's like, oh, I didn't think you were going to crack. Now I feel like I've wasted my time. This is a really cool idea. I was going to wind up your intestines upon this bike as we pedaled. Eh, let's do it anyways. I love gloriously evil characters, and they're always a lot of fun to watch. That's um, what's so great about Michael Ironside. I, I do have to point out the little joke that while watching this movie... Halfway through, I'm like, that's the bad guy from Free Willy. <laughs> and that, yeah, it took us a while to figure that out. We had to go look it up instantly. It's like, huh, that, that I like to think that was actually the same character. Let's, let's, let's suppose <laughs> that Free Willy and Turbo Kid take place in the same universe. Uh, that's my suggestion for uh, Turbo Kid to, we'll have him ride a whale. <laughs> I, I never actually seen Michael Ironside. Like, I, I just don't recognize him, but I do recognize his voice because I recognize him as Sam Fisher from Splinter Cell. Oh, yeah. That's like who he is. Sam Fisher is Meg Lanternside. Meg Lanternside is Sam Fisher. Nobody else can do that voice. I don't care. Now, this movie definitely has a love of other movies and does a lot of homages as well, where uh, we have one scene where Apple is training our titular hero, uh, the kid, which he doesn't actually have a name. I was trying to think for a, for a moment. Does Turbo Kid have a name? He's just known as the kid. And they reference the Karate Kid. Strike hard, strike fast, no mercy. And then she explains it out further. Um, did you did you notice any particular references you're into? Um, when Apple just comes into his little lair, she gets him a box of Soylent Vert. Yeah, and it's so subtle. Um... That's one thing is, I think this actually takes place in post-apocalyptic Quebec, which is kind of weird because I've never thought of post-apocalyptic Quebec. Just Quebec? Uh, <laughs> yeah, just Quebec. <laughs> yeah, two of the things that give it away is, you know, the, they have the cereal box in French and they also show a stop sign instead of stop, it says arrête. My favorite part was when, uh, the, my favorite homage was... The gnome stick. The gnome stick. The gnome stick. Um, the kid makes a weapon for Apple. Oh. There, I almost forgot. And uh, what he does is he takes a, a Laura gnome and he puts it on a bat and he duct tapes it together. And she's like, this is so pretty. This is my gnome stick. Did you have, I didn't ask your favorite death scene, Megan. What's your favorite death scene? It was, it was the one where the guys split off into two. When they get shot with the with the turbo beam. Oh, the starting and, of the totem pole. Yeah, the starting of the totem pole. Same. The first part that was my favorite, just because it reminded me of the Deadpool game, where one of the half of soldiers' body lands on you, and, and Deadpool says, "Hey, we're inside a dude," and one of his others, one of his other personalities says, and not in a fun way either. 
Now, w- one of the things I also love about this movie, it's got this sort of like retro 90s feel, and that's becoming a pretty popular lately. There's uh, been quite a few, th- few things that have been going back to that. Uh, actually, a new cartoon uh, aired on uh, Comedy Central that I got to catch. It's called uh, Moonbeam City that it sort of has that same sort of vibe where... The technology within the show, um, it's an animated feature, um, but the technology in the show is sort of futuristic, but sort of not, and still kind of set in the 90s, and it has this Miami, futuristic Miami vice is the best way I can pitch it. So, like, Kung Fury? Uh, sort of. Um, with this one, it's not post-apocalyptic, it's definitely within society, um, and it's starting in the, starring the number one cop, Dazzler Moonbeam. That sounds ridiculously yes. like Sailor Moon almost. I'll have to show you. I think it does take a lot of inspiration from Archer, but that's not a bad thing because Archer's amazing and it definitely has its own sort of feel to it. Now, I want to go back a little bit to Turbo Kid here as well. So let's talk about more in depth about some of the scenes we uh, that we really thought were good because the cool thing about this movie is I have not seen this style of movie in a long time and it used to be really popular because it reminds me of things like you know the karate kid um mad max mad max and it was these sort of you know it was more popular within the 80s and 90s where you had these simple hero stories where you'd see them you know build up and you would have you know slower climax and it would keep building and building and building and I can't remember the last time I've seen this movie. Um, it would be things like, I would say, Tank Girl or Johnny Mnemonic. Th- movies that never did well at the box office, but always got its second breath when it came back on home video. And it's cool to see that we have you know, the internet now with these n- being able to d- distribute digitally. Because this movie I don't think would ever work in theaters, but I'm so glad it got made. I, I do love the fact of independent cinema becoming so much bigger now because of easy distribution. And yeah, especially like things like Indiegogo and Kickstarter, like things that you would that would never be made by a studio. A studio would stare at you and think you were crazy wanting to make the post-apocalyptic 1997. But movies like Turbo Kid prove that it not only can be done, it can be done and be well-received on absolutely no budget. Not only that, but the fact that it's all practical effects, which if you've ever listened to us, you know I've got to... Practical effects always win over CGI, especially when it comes to kills. Yes, yeah. And I mean, for the CGI they use in the film, it's very, very basic. It's just for the turbo laser, but they always have the blood be this giant explosion and shower. Um, we, we Not to spoil the ending, but of course there's lots of blood in the ending, and we have our we have the kid and Apple under this umbrella in a shower of blood just everywhere and it's glorious and hilarious over the top gore i i swear they were inspired by tokyo gore house films i guarantee it i saw so many just little nods to other genres other movies and even in the the opening there where we had uh oh i think it was frederick the uh yeah it was frederick he was the arm wrestler he was our you know bamf character and he uh, was arm wrestling. He looked like Indiana Jones arm wrestling, you know. The guy from Temple of Doom. The guy from Temple of Doom. That's one thing that's cool about this movie as well is the way they settle disputes is, well, besides, you know, regular fighting and killing and stuff like that, is arm wrestling. And it's not just regular arm wrestling. In the opening scene, they had these branding irons stuck inside of toasters so they heat, you know, they would heat up and then they would arm wrestle over top of it. And then when there was he's kid back from kidnapped from the like, a bad guy, he has blades and fire, and, and then they the fire goes out and, and just starts freaking out about it. Yeah, they set up blenders with flame shooting out of them to arm wrestle over top of them. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just the funniest thing when it shuts off and he's like, "I stand flames." <laughs> <laughs> that and that's one thing they did so well in this movie is it's. It's so funny. It's actually hilarious, and they they know exactly the type of movie they wanted to make, and then they made it. It was a great movie. I really enjoyed it. I would like to see more. So see, he's going out into the wasteland further. There's more he can do. Yeah, I'm hoping for a sequel as well. So, I mean, independent film, 
I'm you know buy this one legally. Support the uh, support the studio. If, if I ever see it in HMV, I'm gonna buy me a copy. Uh, I'm not sure if they have a physical distribution yet. I think it's just uh, digital only, but I'm pretty sure it's online through things like iTunes and such. But there's no doubt that there might be an eventual DVD release. Oh, if they have a DVD release, I will have this and I want it signed by everybody. That's the time you find out the whole cast to be at Fan Expo. Oh, if that happens, you know you and I are like jumping in my car and just driving we're there we're I, there i wish i had a hard copy of brendan small's galacticon it's in it it's a comic book in a cd oh and i want it on a hard copy but he hasn't released any what's it about because uh for those of you who don't know brendan smalls did things like uh home movies where uh, and metalocalypse and metalocalypse uh what's what's this one okay so galacticon is about this god and he loses his powers because he gets a divorce. Um, okay, so he gets a divorce from his wife, and stuff goes down. This this preacher is like, "Hey, I see the future. Don't save your wife." Um, she gets kidnapped. And it's this a- is really dark. Brendan Smalls usually does more funny stuff here, so this is actually like a serious. This take. is like a, This is pretty serious. I mean, it gets there's like some funny parts in it a little bit because it does kind of get ridiculous, but it's actually really good. I'll have to send. I'll have to send you. Uh, a link to like a preview or whatever of it we'll try to check it out after the show now folks i want to thank you so much for tuning in we are coming to our closing here so if you want to continue the conversation online you can do so on our facebook page at facebook.com slash thunder speak want to follow us on other social media at thunder geeks instagram tumblr and twitter want to send us some email some fan mail anything you want to send us you can do so at thunder geeks at luradio.ca our final song here is going to be from Kari Marin, and it's Damn Those Dwarves. And, of course, tune in next week always to Thunder Geeks, Sundays at 10.30 p.m. on 102.7 FM. See you next week. <laughs>